Fairies on the Storm. Hello and welcome to Fireside with the VC. My name is Andrew Romans and it's a great pleasure to have old friend, fundpreneur, Sean Seton Rogers. Thanks for joining us, Sean. It's, uh, it's great to be here. I was just remembering the last time I saw you and uh, I don't know if you remember as well, but for me, it was my last business trip. So that was back in <laughs> February. You and I were both uh, in a bar in Berlin and we ran into each other and had a few drinks together. So uh, boy, I wish I could continue to do that sort of stuff, don't you? I, I know, I know. It's such a difference in lifestyle. I, uh, you know, you're in London, I'm in Silicon Valley. And for me, scheduling my calls to Asia, like KL, Singapore, Jakarta, China, Hong Kong, is normally like, well, I've got a busy event. I'm speaking here. I'm going to this event. Sean Seton Rogers is in town. Where now, my evenings are there. I'm available. <laughs> I have a different perspective on the evenings, which is my kids are getting a little bit older now. They're getting very busy with activities. And the you know 30 years from now, I'll look back uh, quite fondly on at least the part where we had 100 straight family dinners together uh, and we weren't rushing to activities and I was traveling and so forth. So that part was was really nice. I mean, clearly everything else is absolutely chaotic, um, but uh, you know, silver lining to every cloud. You know, Woodside Capital Partners, you may know uh, the, Rudy and those guys, they sent out their update the other day of saying how COVID is changing things. And they're making the argument for, yeah, you can leave the super city and go to Texas and not pay taxes or work out of Tahoe. Like they're literally saying that. And everyone's like, maybe what am I doing here if there's no meetings or events? And they're saying it's going to come back, but we're never going to be the same with our families. Like now that we've been with our families so much in 2020, that's going to remain important. And I guess these oh, guys have I spent no time with their families before. <laughs> I thought you were going to say that we're going to want to get the heck away from them after spending so much time with them, but uh, no, I'm, right, right, right. I'm kidding. It, it, um, you know, I, I, uh, I, I can appreciate both sides of the argument. I, um, I love the flexibility of working from home, of not commuting. I must say my podcast listening has gone way down because of the lack of commute, uh, which is a shame. I don't get to listen to your podcast as frequently as I probably should. Um, but uh, I do think there is a benefit for people being together. Uh, the serendipity, the spontaneous conversations, oh, yeah. the ideas that flow from it. And so I would love us to get back to a hybrid environment where uh, maybe it's one or two days a week, everyone's in the office, uh, and the rest of the time it's up to people to make an individual choice. Um, so, but we'll see. We'll yeah, see you know, I'm doing, I'm doing a wine tasting series. I've got this cousin from Brooklyn, who has been in LA at, he's a sommelier at a really fancy restaurant. And what we do is we ship wine, like six 50 centiliter bottles to people's homes. We get Jared on, on a Zoom and nothing's recorded. I mean, this is like Chatham house rule, the opposite of recorded. Right. And Jared walks us through some wine tasting and you see like 30% of VCs that you're friends with. And then you meet a few other ones. And then I lead a round table discussion and we kind of talk about different things. And you know, investing over Zoom and social injustice and how to get out of your bubbles and all these things. And right. then um, uh, people meet each other over that and then they do their one-on-one -on -one Zoom. And I think we're getting close to saying everyone gets their own barrel and we can do this outside. And you know, maybe start to you know, have that networking. But that serendipity of like, I'm in Berlin, I see you. Yep. And I'm like, oh, you've got to meet me. Sean Seton Rogers. And because I'm saying how, you know, this is a great fund and a great guy, that serendipity is very hard to do over WeChat and WhatsApp, you know. And, and don't get me started on the virtual conference platform so far. I, I think they are um, incredibly painful. So there's a long way to go in that space. So yeah, yeah. yeah. I hope Donald Hopefully Trump someone is out right. there has the next great investment. I hope Donald Trump is right about one thing. It's all going to be over. It's going to go away right away. It, it, that's one thing I'm rooting for. I, I hope we don't have to hear from him ever again in 30 days or whatever it is, 22 days. <laughs> yeah, I know. Let's I know, not I know. get into politics. That's, uh, that's too difficult. Okay. Well, listen, quick background. Now, let me introduce you. So Sean Seton Rogers, we met when you were at uh, Benchmark Capital Europe, which was still named that, rebranded as uh, Balderton, uh, one of the bigger funds in, in Europe and the UK. And then... You, I think you started at Bain Consulting and then found your way to Commonwealth Venture Capital um, before getting out there. I know you're a Wharton MBA. And, uh, and I'm curious, and, and you know, my God, I was looking at your LinkedIn, 11 and a half years of pro-founders. That feels like yesterday to me that you started it. Like our kids are getting older, we're getting older. Uh, 
that, wow, it's been a long time. Uh, yeah, I, I would make a joke. Actually, if anyone's listening to this, they wouldn't see the picture, but I'd make a joke that I had hair back then. But that is obviously a joke because, as Andrew knows, I have been bald since age 22. So uh, that's right. Unfortunately, the hair's been gone for a, a long time. But uh, yeah, it's uh, what do they say? It's similar to what they say about kids. The, uh, the days are long, but the years are short. And I think it's the same way in, in venture capital as well, because it is, uh, you know, it's a unique industry. And, and at times it's, uh, it's, it's very hot and everyone wants to be in it. And then at other times people say, that's crazy. Why would anyone do that when it's way more fun to be an entrepreneur um, or go work at a hedge fund or whatever else it might be? Uh, but uh, I'm one of those, I suppose, VC lifers now. Um, I've been doing it for, for quite a while. And I still wake up every day super excited about it. I, I think I'm privileged to have what is one of the best jobs in the world. Um, and so even after you know, 10, 11 years at, at ProFounders, um, I, I still get excited about the next big company that's out there or um, God forbid dealing with ones that, that are having a, a harder time. So I, uh, I love it. Yeah, I mean, uh, sometimes you, you feel it on the, with some of the East Coast New York VCs are really freaking out when a company is going through very choppy waters. And I'm like, hey man, come over here this is your job. There's going to be like always some guy fighting with his co-founder and it's total Armageddon. You got to get, you got to stop and smell the flowers. This is, this is what you do, right? There's going to, not uh, all of them are overnight instant successes, right? Man, I, I love it when I, uh, I see a VC that goes, uh, oh, you know, I only spend my time on the best companies. I really focus on those. And I actually sometimes go up to them and say, I'm amazed that you do that because I spent all my time on the ones that aren't doing well. Uh, the ones that are doing well, I go to the board meeting, we pat each other on the back and we go out for, used to go out for a nice dinner and, and some wine. Uh, so I, I guess, I guess you're different to me because I spent all my time on the ones that are kind of at that, that tipping point, right? Where you yeah. don't know if they're going to be able to make it and they need help on trying to figure out what are the one or two proof points that they need to establish. They need help on a customer introduction that'll make a difference. They need help on uh, looking through, um, the next round pitch deck, they need help on interviewing someone. And that's where I spend all my time. Yeah, I, and I find it very rewarding when there's a massive crisis with a company and I'm able to uh, really get involved. And this is where I'm very behind on email because I've got a serious all my bandwidth thing happening. And then especially if you're teaming up with, you know, Rogan or one of your co-founders at the fund and really coming in and helping you know, your founder be a gladiator with really hard people getting in their way. I find that incredibly rewarding. Um, as yes, opposed but, but to- as you know, Andrew, it's, um, they, uh, it's not about us telling the companies what to do, right? We, we can't tell them what to do. We're there to be sounding boards um, and we can offer some uh, of the, um, you know, the tough advice, if you will, but we can't run the company. Uh, if, we, if we're actually having to step in to actually run the company, you're in a really, really tricky situation. And so it's, um, it's, uh, it's that tipping point. That, that's what we talk about. You've got to help people that are right on the edge or either making it or, or not making it. Um, and that's what consumes most of our time. And then, of course, uh, a little bit is spent regretting the great opportunities that we didn't invest into that got yeah. away. But then at times celebrating the ones that uh, have worked out well. Well, it's, it's all very, very, very true. Um, so... Um, Sean, you're originally from, from Texas. Um, how did you, a lot of people pivot geographically with their MBA, but you went to Wharton. So most of the American VCs in London, of which there are many, um, seem to have gone to LBS or NSEAD or something where you didn't. How did you, how did you go from Dallas to Boston to you know, Philadelphia to London? Uh, I keep joking that I move to more and more expensive cities as uh, as I get older, <laughs> and uh, my offices become smaller and smaller. Right? I, I was a, a chemical engineer in university, and my summer internship at, uh, at at this big oil and gas company, I had my own office. It was a huge office uh, because that's the way things were done back then. And now, uh, at age forty something, uh, I have an open plan space uh, with a little desk, and actually. Frankly, I'm upstairs in the guest bedroom now. is is my is my right. home office. But uh, yeah, no. So for me, uh, it's it's a great question because um, even to this day, I sometimes think back and say, "Wow, how did how did I end up in London? How did I end up with two kids that have British accents uh, and wear ties to school?" Because I definitely wouldn't have thought <laughs> that would have happened many many years ago. Uh, but you know, it's uh, uh, life is what happens when you're busy making plans. Uh, I think that's a John Lennon uh, lyric. And, uh, and for me, it was uh, a unique opportunity at a unique time in life. Um, so I had known the benchmark capital 
U.S. partners. Um, I was just coming out of business school. I spent a little bit of time in London uh, a few years prior, and and I I basically said I'd love to go. You know, I, I love I love early stage companies. I love tech. Uh, I'd love to spend some time doing this in Europe. It seems like a really nascent market. The opportunity to come in and make a meaningful difference from the investment side. As so I called up the folks at Benchmark US and said, "Hey, I've noticed you have a team in in Europe. Could you just make an introduction? Just uh, you know, send my resume over and let me have a call with them." Uh, and things kind of spiraled. And uh, six weeks later, I was living in London, convinced my wife that we need to move over for only one year. Um, uh -huh. And, and by the, the way, I moved to London. Now. I moved to London for one year, and then took my British citizenship, taking an oath to the Queen and her heirs in Kensington Town Hall, um, where they say you have to say you're committed to staying. And I'm like, the yes. only reason I'm doing this is I'm moving back to the Valley. I want my passport that says European Union on it too. This looks like a really good passport. Yes. So I went for one year, stayed for ten. It's uh, it's it's crazy. Um, yes, and that European passport. I hate to break it to you after the thirty first of December. Um, not as useful as it might have been. So it'll what, be good what, for the UK, what, what but happened? unfortunately, I didn't hear about this. Didn't hear about that. Uh, I don't want to talk about it. It was twenty sixteen. It was a rough year politically. <laughs> okay, okay. So 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 it was a uh, it was an outreach to benchmark capital in the valley that was six weeks. Rapidly got you over there. I think they were lucky to get you because I remember those days. Um, I was probably more social then than I am now. And I didn't have to say, hey, Sean, do you, are you going to go to this event? Because it looks like a good one. It was like, cheers, Norm is going to be there. You were at every networking event that I went to. Uh, so well, I can only I mean, imagine how many you were going to when, you, when they but, brought you over to London. I had to. I didn't. I didn't know anyone. Um, and the only way to meet people uh, at that time. Now you can do maybe Zoom calls with everyone. But at the time, was to get out, feet on the street, yeah. hustle. Um, yeah. And so I, I was forced into doing that. I, you know, now uh, I'm a little bit older, kids, uh, but a network as well that's been built up over the the many many years. But at that's the time, right. it's it's the it's the traditional way to break in. You gotta you gotta you know, work the old shoe leather. Uh, as as they say, and get out there and meet people, and uh, and still to this day, I think one of the big things I miss about the current environment is I don't get to go to events, I don't get to run into people. And we touched on it earlier, the serendipity of meeting Andrew, who says, "Hey, you got to speak to this person." Um, it's well, that's uh, it, what I'm trying tough. to do. That's what I'm trying to do with my like 12 person wine tasting events. Is that I'm I try to make it so that you don't know everybody that's going to be there, but you know two or three, you know. So it's good, it's great. you know, out of sight, out of mind. So they see each other like, oh, dude, you know, we, we, we are investing and we've got a company that's, you know, right. looking for money now. They're in play to be bought. And then I think that's important. We, we've got to, it's kind of like when we put real world stuff on the internet, that was a wave of venture. Now it's like, how do we do real world stuff on the internet to achieve some of the same stuff? But look, I think a lot of VCs um, start off as an associate and then 12 years later, they're general partner of a 40 year old fund. And the world needs that, but it doesn't impress me as much as guy like you who actually, although you're a venture capitalist, I would say you're an entrepreneur and you've created ProFounder in a really wonderful network way. There's a great vibe. I like your co-founders. There's always been this support of real entrepreneurs behind it that I think put some of the original money in. So. Tell us the story of the birth of ProFounder and how you've attempted to do things differently and why, why people like me seem to like it. Yeah, no, no happy to. So yes, yeah, so I spent uh, close to five years at, at the Benchmark Europe team and it was, uh, it was a fantastic learning experience, insanely smart people, great fund. Um, uh, but, but for me, I, I think it, the opportunity to set out and do something you know, with others uh, on my own was just incredibly attractive. So I was uh, I was fortunate during the time that I was at Benchmark. I had the opportunity to work very closely with one of the companies that that we invested in called Bebo, which was a very early yeah. social networking site. And uh, Michael is is was an amazing founder. Um, the company was bought by AOL for eight hundred fifty million dollars. Um, uh, a fantastic fantastic run, a fantastic outcome for everyone involved. Um, now Michael himself was living in San Francisco, um, but is originally British. Um, has a British accent. Uh, likes to go to the pub, everything that you expect out of a good Brit. Um, and so we became kind of good friends and uh, a lot of brainstorming with him and a few others. And and Michael kept saying, you know what's really special about Silicon Valley? And the reason that my company is a hybrid company that is in Silicon Valley uh, with a lot of team in London as well, is that um, it's got this amazing pay it forward culture uh, that has existed here for many, many years, where if you're successful, you will proactively invest in the next generation, not only your money, but your time as well. And I wish we had that in Europe. 
And so a lot of that over, over beers, and that was the inspiration for ProFounders, which was let's try to mimic and recreate the West Coast model of founders investing in and supporting the next generation of founders uh, in, a, in a fun structure. So let's, let's try to formalize it and really bring that to, to Europe. Now, it's also, you got to remember, this is 20, 20, 2009, 2010. Uh, there weren't that many successful European founders, but we went out there, we spoke to a number of them, uh, and we were able to raise our first fund from 23 different entrepreneurs who had built and exited companies, uh, and they gave us their, their, their time and their money as part of the fund structure. And so that allowed us to properly set up and start investing into, into early stage European companies. Uh, and it was, you know, we, we really think the, the founder supporting founder structure helped us in many, many ways. Number one, it gave us a brand that we didn't deserve at the time uh, because these were quite high profile people, people who had built some of Europe's biggest companies. So that, that helped. Uh, they helped us source investments because they were always being asked to be angel investors and now they could send them over and, to and us. By, by the way, I just want to yeah. inject and say this, like this is a really big point that not everyone understands. When I raised my first 15 million and then 27 million for the GTX, the company that I started, right. you're speaking at conferences, you know, typically, and all the founders queue up and line up to talk to you afterwards saying, hey, can you introduce me to NEA? Can you introduce me to Scott Sandell? And so your deal flow starts when you're funded. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, in, currently in ProFounders, our best source is from the portfolio. Uh, oh, yeah. it's, from, it's from people that have taken our money and say, hey, you got to speak to the person that invested in my company, please. Here, here's Sean, here's Rogan, here's Joe, or anyone else. And this is what uh, they did. So, like like yeah. they get the they'll hear that they met Michael or they met Brent Hoberman or one of these other people that's right. around your network. Perfect. Uh, yes, no, exactly. And so, um, so yeah, so that was the, the inspiration behind ProFounders. The, the founders gave us a leg up as far as sourcing, um, as far as vetting the opportunities as well, doing due diligence for us. But then most importantly, they actually committed some element of their time to help out the individual companies that we invested into. So we tried not to overpromise. We had a joke that Michael was not moving into your office five days a week to make coffee for the team. Um, but hey, you want to talk somewhat about viral loops and how to grow the, uh, you know, the, the K factor? Uh, you know, Michael spent no money ever and grew at. It seems like a small number now, but at the time, 60 million users was a lot. I know in today's day and age, it's not as many in some of the social platforms, but uh, he was able to do that and then worked a lot with Pinterest and others. And so that. Uh, that, that right introduction, that right connection, that right piece of advice from a successful founder can make a meaningful difference. But we also, and I, I firmly believe this, we, we can't overstate it, it's up to the next generation to actually make it happen, right? Uh, someone could put you in front of someone to say, Here, here's an introduction, tell them about the business, but the company has to sell, stand on its own two feet, needs to be able to sell its product, sell itself, um, et cetera. But little nudges can go a long way. And, and by the way, I don't know if you know this, but uh, you probably remember I ran this equity exchange club, uh, equity exchange fund, Indeed, the yes, founders yeah, club. Of course. So, the, so all VC-backed founders before there was a secondary market were putting up to 10% of their common ordinary shares into a pool, and then they get ownership of the entire pool. So it made like a fight club of these VC-backed guys from different parts of the world that are not just right. paying it forward. They're like, dude, I own part of your company. I will help you raise your next round or solve this problem. And it kind of, it scaled a bit. That was my initial closing of uh, Rubicon. So it was all VC-backed founders that right. put the money in. So it was similar. I don't know if I was inspired by you or if it just, I didn't know what to do with all these founders. They wanted to invest together, but that's what happened for us too. So it's oh, kind of similar. That, yes. Before I forget, uh, this always cracks me up. Uh, I heard that uh, Benchmark Europe was like even paying someone, what should we rebrand ourselves at? And and after all that, they came up with the name Balderton. Can you tell the story of how that name was chosen? Uh, so in the, uh, yes, yeah, so there was a, it came time for the, uh, the funds to separate just in the natural kind of evolution and life cycle and, and focus on Europe and so forth. And uh, there was a rebranding exercise and there was uh, you know, kind of money thrown at the problem. Uh, and in the end, um, herding cats, herding VCs together to make a decision is is near impossible, right? So I won't go through the machinations of what took place and uh, the fighting over a name and a URL and all that sort of stuff. But I think they went for the tried and true methodology of you name yourself after the street upon which you were founded, uh, which has worked up and down, uh, you know, uh, Wall Street and the private equity world, but in the venture capital world as well. Um, yeah, and but it's, it's never... You know, it's it's never never amazing, but I'm sure the people at at Sequoia thought that was ridiculous at first. But you know, the name is what you make of it in the end. And so yeah, but, it's, uh, it's but, worked but out when well. you 
but you 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 obviously remember when you walk into the office on Belderton Street, which I did many times, yeah. dealing with that horrible investment committee that couldn't decide on a name. You know, maybe the same with the startup. But in walking through, when you walk through the entrance, on the left was this massive, like three foot thick piece of glass that's edged in like some ice luge sculpture, like pouring vodka through it that says Balderton. And you guys were just renting that place up on the upper floors. Fifth floor, fifth floor, So yes. I thought, that's pretty cool. You walk in, you're like, whoa, Balderton. It's like, no, that's just the building. It's got nothing to do with it. So I thought you named it because you're like, that's right, World Trade Center Ventures. The whole it's, thing is us. I, I wish it was, uh, you know, maybe psychologically that was the basis behind it, but it was literally running out of time. Um, it was overthinking a problem and then saying, you know what? Let's just go for the simple solution and, and move forward. And uh, uh, and the firm has done an amazing job in creating a real brand right uh, from it. So I always think yeah. it's, uh, you know, listen, I always tell people, especially founders, when they, when they if we invest super early and they're thinking about the URL and the name, um, you, you can overthink it. You can, it's, uh, it's like opinions. Everyone's got one. Uh, everyone has well, an opinion. You know, yeah. Tony Conrad, Tony Conrad, a great VC who's been an entrepreneur. He sold two company. He founded True Ventures. They keep raising $200 million funds. And then he keeps going back and starting a company and selling it again to AOL. He founded About.me and he'll talk to you for an hour or more. And you're like, Tony, stop telling me the importance of choosing a name. He's like, it's hard work. If you guys are like, oh, we're out of time. What, what street am I on? That's it. We're Safeways Ventures because I'm in Safeways. But yeah, he's yeah. saying like, really pick your name because it creates a soul and about dot me wouldn't it you know wouldn't have been what it was without without the name but yeah. listen we but, only have so much time yeah, go ahead i was gonna say that that was the idea behind pro founders right so we have to be sensitive to the fact that we don't want to be more profound than anyone else but the whole idea was we are pro we are for founders uh, and the url was available so it worked out well i never thought of it as being profound i always thought it was pro founder that was to me, that's all I, I, I was seeing. Excellent, but, good. So, so pro founders now, where do you see yourself in the British and even post-Brexit European landscape? And maybe give us the quick, boring, where do you invest geographically? Sure, yeah. What stage do you invest at? And what sectors are you most Excellent. interested in? Excellent. So we are a lean and mean team of four right now, based in London, investing across Europe. Uh, so Andrew, you'll know, we actually put into our legal documents that we can invest in any Eurovision song contest country, which for Americans, <laughs> please really find wrong. the videos. Will Smith did a new movie. I mean, not Will Smith, Will, Will, um, Farrell. Will, Will Farrell. Farrell did a movie making fun of Eurovision, but know, it is a pan-European annual singing competition, uh, and it includes greater Europe. So everything from Ireland to Uzbekistan, if you will. So we, uh, we jokingly put that into our legal documents where we actually invest. We've invested in the UK, Germany, Finland, Spain, Switzerland, Poland, and Belgium so far. So that is the geographic breadth of what we've done. Um, we're, we're quite consistent. We want to invest into the first institutional rounds of capital that a company raises. And so that used to, five, six years ago, be a half million euro check into a million euro, million dollar round. The nature of the, the kind of inflation in the market now means we're writing 750000 to $1 million checks into two to $4 million rounds. So we're always co-investing alongside others. Um, we're uh, taking board seats if need be, but we're under underwriting about half of that investment round into a business. Uh, and then the investment thesis is quite simple as well. So some people say, well, we only do consumer or we only do enterprise and we only do B2B. We say we want to invest into businesses that use technology to fix a broken customer experience. So every business that we meet, we try to say, how do they use technology to make faster or better or cheaper or easier? What is a really painful, broken consumer experience or a really painful, broken business experience on behalf of stakeholders for that business? So examples, we're investors in made.com, which is a really big e-commerce business here in the UK, selling furniture, D2C brand, one of the first actually native D2C brands built in Europe, hundreds of millions in revenue, but it basically allows you to get a, a sofa without the massive markup that all of the uh, kind of the retailers traditionally charge you. We're also investors in Unity, which went public a couple of weeks ago, which is the games engine. So it allows you to build your mobile phone game once and deploy it across Android, iOS, or any other sort of platform that is out there. Um, so that is a broken B2B experience, right? That is how do you help game developers deal with a plethora of devices, screen sizes, um, uh, operating platforms, and everything else that comes from it, and monetization as well. And so uh, we're big believers that 
you, you actually, it's great for some people to be very focused. Um, we believe there are great pockets of expertise across all of Europe geographically and vertically. And so we want to be open to investing into to anything that's that fits that bill. You know, it feels like uh, uh, a decade ago, but I think I was at Connie Borsch's Mountain Partners Tegernsey event in Bavaria in April of 2019. And it, that, that feels like 50 years ago to me. And there was a guy from EIF giving a presentation about the performance of the European venture capital asset class, vintage by vintage, comparing it directly with the United States. And when you compare, when you say the United States venture capital asset class, I'm like, well, does that include every fund in outside of Atlanta and Houston? I mean, what, you know, you know, or, or does that even include Fidelity investing in a 70 billion pre-money valuation of Uber? You know, like what is venture? But right. I was pretty surprised actually to see the performance was just steadily getting better. So I probably left Europe at the wrong time. <laughs> And, and um, you know, I was always like, this will be the decade for Europe. And then I was always wrong. And then now that I left, it's, it's doing well. But what's your perception? Or do you even have Cambridge Associates pitch book data that, that, that actually says this is, this is like top quartile in Europe would have been, you know, third, third quartile US or what's happening? Yeah. So, so uh, what do they always say? 80% of, st 80% of statistics are made up or, or something to that effect, right? So I think data is... Um, Data can be used in many, many different ways. I guess here is my assessment of the European versus the US market, which is that on average, they're probably equivalent. So if you look across European funds and US funds, let's call it Series A focused 50 to $250 million venture capital funds, they're probably quite, quite consistently the same, the IRR, BPI, TVPI, all those kind of crazy metrics. Where I think the US still outperforms is on the outperformer side. So I think if you looked at the top five funds in the US, I would think they dramatically outperform the top five funds in, in Europe. But the reality is it's five out of 500 funds. So that gets kind of blended together. And, uh, um, you know, the overall difference is not, not that great. Uh, but I think on the outlier edge, the U.S. funds still, you know, the U.S. is still producing $100 billion companies. Europe is producing 20 to $30 billion companies now. And so you look at, at uh, Spotify or Adyen or Klarna, uh, here in Europe or, you know, the up-and-comers Revolut or Monzo in the banking space. They're absolutely fantastic companies. From a VC perspective, you only need one or two of those to generate an absolutely amazing fund. Um, but Europe is missing the really large sort of platform businesses still, right? So where's our Google, Facebook, Amazon, um, Netflix uh, sort of businesses? Uh, we don't have those yet. I, I think we're getting closer and, and We've got some uh, runners in the space, uh, so you know, UiPath um, in the um, uh, robotic automation space is absolutely fantastic and a worldwide leader. Obviously, Spotify in the music space is the is the global leader. Uh, I think a lot of fintech innovation is coming out of Europe now, uh, having mostly come out of London, which has been the center of the finance world for a very long time. So I, I'm super bullish. I really do think the 2020s are the decade when Europe catches up um but everyone's catching up to the u.s to the u.s as well now right uh yeah. it's not only yeah. it's, not, it's not only europe it's asia it's, well, it's, asia. it's china southeast asia uh latam you know it's uh it, everyone's running hot on the u.s's heels right now yeah I mean, I mean governments everywhere are you know putting up a lot of money and we'll talk about that in a minute but what percentage of your exits um and even perceived exits are ipo versus m a i'm thinking it's mostly m a it is mostly M and A, um, without a doubt. The the uh, going public in Europe is, um, is 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 just not as established uh, kind of thing. It's it's harder to do. Um, so it is. Uh, I would say it's ninety percent uh, M and A. Uh, and I think in the U.S. It, it's you know it's it's not ninety percent, but it's still a meaningful part, right? M and A uh, is just I, cleaner, easier for everyone. We've had some IPOs, but I think that uh, the expectation is that it's going to be M and A, and you can even threaten yeah. M and A by dual tracking with an IPO to make them yeah. pay up, you know, but, and, and this is a point to get to what percentage of your M&A exits, which is like most of your exits, go to American domiciled buyers versus European domiciled buyers. It's like, oh, where are the big balance yeah. sheet buyers? 
Yes, that is a good point. Um, so it, um, without a doubt, by by number, it's uh, it's going to be U.S. players looking at European acquisitions as market entry um, into into this this, this territory, right? Um, and so, they can often overpay. Like if you look back to like Flickr and Picasa, where Google, where Yahoo was right there, kind of with Google at at one point, that mm. you know Fl Flickr was acquired by. Uh, uh, Yahoo, and I think even Esther Dyson from right. London was in that, and she was like early in that. And then you've got Picasso being bought by Google. Google could afford to overpay way more than Yahoo because they have more traffic, right? So they could buy something for a crazy price and still be a creative and make money on that acquisition based on their ability to like the combined DCF with that M&A. Where, where also the US buyers, after SAP, there's not you know, they, they're like Yahoo who can't pay as much as Google sometimes. I just right. want to hear what your, what your thoughts are around that. No, no, and, and that's exactly right. And I think the other reason that, Europe, that the US players have an advantage here is from a pricing arbitrage perspective as well, right? So if they look across doing M&A in the US, uh, it's just more expensive. Companies in Europe just have been cheaper for a very long time. And that cheaper flows the entire way through it, right? The companies in Europe generally have raised less money at lower valuations. Um, and therefore, what would cost you a billion in the US costs you 400 million here. And it's actually fantastic for the European ecosystem because the prices have in the past, and I think it has changed quite a bit recently. Uh, but in the past, there's definitely pricing arbitrage between the US and Europe. Now, I think that has changed dramatically in the last three to four years. And I was part of say, that that's is- not, That's not obvious to me. I mean, I would think uh, if I'm in California and I can buy a company in California, or I could buy the same top line, bottom line, EBITDA, whatever ratios of a company in Germany, I, I would overpay for the German, I would pay more for the German company to expand my footprint, get into that dynamic market, all kinds of like Volkswagen made a factory in Brazil because of the tariffs. Yeah. You know, you, you just don't have to though, because you can get them cheaper. Uh, Repatriating tax. You know, yeah. Cisco hired Frederick Rambeau out of Apex, invested in 54 VC funds in Europe, and then started cherry picking direct investing and then acquiring they had nobody in europe and they had all this tax to pay to move it back to the us yes exactly yeah no that has been part of the uh, the mna process as well but i do think that is um that's changing as well now if i look at the on multiple levels right number one the world is flatter because um the information there is no uh, distance of information anymore everyone reads the exact same blogs listens to the same podcasts so we see it with founders now that they don't sit there and say oh i'm in europe therefore the price is lower they go hey i saw what the yc companies are getting out of coming out I want the same pricing, right? Um, and That's so not a good idea. there is. Uh, <laughs> the YC companies uh, they hurt themselves by pricing their round higher than the next round. Nobody wants going to a down round. I, I do think that is a uh, it is an issue to be dealt with. But uh, actually, I say that one of our portfolio companies will be attending the next YC batch, one of the super seed stage ones. So we're excited about the potential markup that comes post. No, I'm joking. <laughs> I'm um, sure. No, I'm absolutely joking. Companies doing great anyway. Uh, but it's, um, you know, the, the world is flatter now. Entrepreneurs have much higher expectations now. Um, and they, they really push to create really global companies, which is, comes back to what we talked about, why I think the 2020s are the year that Europe does produce the, uh, I'm not sure what a, a decacorn is 10 billion. I'm not sure what a uh, centacorn is. Is that, is that 100 billion? I'm not, I'm not sure what the, the terminology is. I, I, let's, uh, let's, let's create that one, if that's, if that's the term. Centurion, what's that club on? Uh, in, oh, yes. In, in uh, Covent Garden area, there. You can name it after the Centurion Club. Exactly. Well, oh, so talk about portfolio construction. You've been in the game long enough that, like, my ideas of the ideal portfolio construction, looking back on it 10 and 15 years later, you're like, well, actually, I did really well here. And although this made a lot of yeah. sense, what percentage of your fund do you? attempt to invest as a first bite in and like how many would there be so if you're doing a 500k yeah. check how many do you have in one fund and over what period of time do you achieve that position in say 25 companies or so and what percentage of the fund is doubling down and when people talk about reserve it sounds like it's a service or something but i think of double down is like i'm gordon gecko i just introduced the company to you know Michael and he managed to get a customer that's going to 5x the revenue and that's going out on telecom cell in yeah. Indonesia that's going to be huge that's a Gordon Gecko buy signal to double down with more money and they're not publicly traded so it's Indeed. legal and encouraged 
but what percentage of your so talk about portfolio construction logic of yeah. like lowering yeah. the risk and Good all to that. Go. yeah no no yeah, actually yeah no and this is um this is a very interesting topic and something we spent a lot of time thinking through as well here at pro founders so i think there are multiple ways in which one can construct a fund right there are some people um, and, and uh, let's talk Dave McClure and what he was doing at 500 Startups, where he was trying to say, I want to be an index to the overall ecosystem, right? I want to make sure that I get a huge amount of companies in there. In that, I'm most likely to get a few that are absolutely fantastic. And um, yes, I don't have a big stake in any of those companies, but if I'm into one of them, it can create transformational returns to my fund. But uh, lower I think impact, is... but, 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 you know, but lower yeah. impact than if he's in 15 companies of and course, one of them yeah. is Google. The impact of that is really felt. Of course, even fund uh, fund investors tell me that if they're in too many VC funds, and one of those is an out, outlier, outsized returns, it's not going to impact. You know, agreed, agreed. And so we, we that Conway is, not is our another approach. one to study we, on that. Yeah, exactly. And we have a we have a different approach here at ProFounders. We we can say we we say we are conviction driven investors. So in any fund, and and we generally raise funds of let's call it seventy five to. $85 million. So actually quite lean, only two partners in the fund. Um, it's where we like to invest. Um, we aim to get about 25 companies per fund. So that is our goal. Every three to four years get to 25 investments. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's where we feel that we've got a broad enough array of businesses where we have a chance to get a very meaningful one. But we also will have a meaningful enough stake of any company that does do insanely well. Um, and so we try to get a minimum of 10% initially of the business, and then we try to get to 25 companies. Um, and, and, so, and now the, our reserve ratio is also uh, probably more extreme than many others. So for every dollar we put to work, we actually set aside $2 to support that company as it grows and matures. Um, and then the way we think about it is um, every quarter, we re reassess the probability that we will use that 2x reserves and, and weight that. And so um, it, we will not guarantee that there's uh, you know three x total into every single company, the initial investment plus two, because guess what? Sometimes there's early exits. Sometimes companies can't raise the next round, and so it differs. And there'll be other companies where we're actually four, five, six x into the investment at the end of the day. Um, and so the so that is the way we like to think about it. And practically, what that means, I'll give you an example. We invested in this company out of Poland called Packhelm. Um, and our general philosophy is that the further away it is from London, the, the smaller the initial check will be. But so we wrote a 750,000 euro, so call it 800, $850,000 check initially into the company as part of a million and a half euro round. The business, uh, this helps um, any e-commerce company, small, medium, large e-commerce company design, order, customized packaging. Um, and so for an e-commerce company, there's very few touch points you get with your consumers. They're all used to the Apple level unboxing experience. Uh, you should be able to give your customers that amazing touch point as well. And Pack Help allows you to do that. And so we, uh, we absolutely love the team. We love the performance of the first nine months where we were investors. So we went to the founders after nine months and we said, here's 2 million euros. So we, uh, we wrote 750 initially. We said, here's 2 million euros. Let's figure out the best way to use this. So if you want to do an internal round right now, we're happy to lead that. And uh, let's do four or five million, including some of the other investors. Or if you want to go to market and raise an external round, you've got a super pro rata commitment from someone that absolutely loves what you're doing. Use this as the basis to go to market. And let me tell you, if you're a founder and you can go out to market and say, hey, existing investors are not only doubling down, they're almost 3Xing down into the business. It's going to move quickly. Do you want to be part of this? It makes your fundraising round super easy, super easy. Yeah, I mean, the diligence, uh, you know, I always say uh, we have uh, the crystal ball of time or post-investment due diligence, which can be deceiving. You think you're in it for five years and you're being defrauded. But um, <laughs> f f when if I see that you were in the deal with 750K and you've been in it over a period of time and you're doubling down like that, a conversation with you would go would avoid me of doing a lot of painful due diligence, like show me the bank statements, making a lot of calls. So, oh, yeah. so always, always got to show the bank statements, but yes, no, I know, I know what you mean, which is uh, it's a, it's a fantastic sign of confidence for the business and uh, for the founders, right? Which is that, Hey, these people, um, you know, they, 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 they've grown to love what I'm doing. They have see the, in fact, they're going to be even happy to pay at a much higher price, a lot more. Uh, pay a lot higher price and invest more um, than they did initially because they think the opportunity is, it's never unlimited, but the opportunity is massive, right? By the way, um, send me an email about that company because we invested in 
a company that I found in Hong Kong and brought over to New York City that is called Easy Ship, where we've all come accustomed to like one click Amazon. And then you're getting some random glass blower couple that sell their stuff and their ability to ship like, sorry, we don't ship to Bangladesh. Yes. Yeah. You know, and so Easy Ship like gives you Amazon shipping on, on like, you know, prime kind of economics and they, they, they're a little bit like a, you know, you switch insurance price comparison thing too. Like they've just got the whole damn right. thing done. So it's, it's in the name, Easy Ship. Exactly. They might pair well with your guys and they're also amazing founders. They, they worked, you know, as like Sam were brothers slaves for a while. So they really, they got just the right amount of that uh, to, 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 to be really good. Um, I just and, made a note. And so how many funds, so 11 and a half years pro founder, how many funds are you up to now? What fund are you on? Yeah, indeed. We have put three separate pools of capital to work and we're going to go out to raise the next pool of capital um, early next year. So that early is next the, year. Uh, so when you were, when I when I saw you in Berlin at Super Return, you're just networking and just shaking up, uh, shaking hands. I think we were still, yeah, I think we were still. Sh were we shaking hands then, or were we fist bumping? I don't remember. But uh, it was, it was it already was... happening. It was already happening. Of like, okay, uh, yes. hey man, I, so I was there yet. I don't want it. Yeah, exactly. Yes, I think we. I think we were probably joking about it when we were fist bumping at the time, which uh, seems insane now. But yes, I was there just to honestly uh, network and chat and run into you at uh, one a.m. in the bar. Yeah, right, 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 right. I think I think the later it got at night, the more it was like hugs and like fist bumping. But um, so with 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 three funds going into fund four, what's your policy of investing across funds? So if you fund a company and you've got different LPs uh, to fund, and so the idea that people talk about for people listening is that if you invest out of fund three into a company from fund one or fund two, it could be seen that it was failing and you should have not put good money after bad and funded it. Then again, if it's just taken off like Zuckerberg, um, your LPs are like, you got a pro rata, you got a relationship with the CEO. Why are you not getting us into Facebook? What's your yeah. policy? Uh, so we do not cross fund. Um, we view the conflict of interest as being too high. Instead, what we would do is if we got one doing well, we would set up an SPV to take up the pro rata and go out to LPs first, first priority to that funds LPs, and then second priority to other LPs uh, to create uh, an investment structure to support the company. So we, we just won't cross fund um, personally. How many SPVs do you have? Have you done or do you have cooking? How bad is your uh, account? So we have actually never, never actually consummated one. So we have thought about really? it, we've pitched it, uh, but it actually hasn't happened. So that, that speaks to reserve policy where we've actually felt we've had enough in reserves to be able to do it. Well, I could talk to you about that if you guys want, or, you know, with Rogan yeah. about it, because I, I, I think I have 70 SPVs that I'm paying for right now. Okay. Um, that sounds like you're keeping a lot of lawyers employed. We, uh, we, actually, I'm almost a lawyer myself at this point. It's, it's yeah. very streamlined. It's a series LLC. Yeah, the okay. accounting is what hurts. The accounting bill is what hurts. You, 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 but, you know, if you make it of a big enough size, yeah. the thing is there's not yeah, a lot of management sure. fee. You know, I kind anyway, of we, we, um, you know, we, we probably should have a number of companies because we, we kind of after the, the fourth round of financing or so, we kind of back off and, and don't do much. But we, there have been definitely times where we absolutely should have been more proactive in setting up SPVs, right? So for, and I know it's a tough space right now, but Get Your Guide, which is one of our rock star companies booking tours and activities, um, we probably could have gone to market for something. But actually, we said, you know what? Um, it's, it's okay. We, our time is, uh, we got other early stage companies we need to focus on. So let's do that. I'm kind of anti-SPV these days, but we, we, we can talk about that. Yeah. That, that that offline. So do you, with, with the network that you've put around pro founders that you can wrap around your portfolio companies, have you kind of institutionalized and let's talk non COVID or maybe COVID of like, you've got a calendar of structured events where the portfolio companies like Michael flies over, or even you go to the battery or something and like they get to meet each other or because if you don't animate the network, it doesn't yeah. kind of do anything. But yeah. I think no, you've we, done uh, stuff. We, we always should be doing more. Um, so we have a broader get together once a year, like many funds do. Um, but actually we have tried to slice and dice the companies um, by vertical, uh, sorry, by, by, by job um, and then by problem as well. And so we created a number of different networking groups uh, that attack each one. So, you know, whether it's a place for all the CTOs to commiserate and chat and have sessions together, or someone saying, actually, I've got a problem um, striking up a B2B partnership, uh, or I, you know, I'm trying to sell into the government. 
who can help me on that? And so we set up task force kind of around those sort of particular pain points that a company might have. Um, so, so we do less of the, let's get everyone together all the time and just kind of chat and more of these kind of slice and dice sort of uh, vertical approaches. One that we do that's similar to that is how to build a sales organization. And sometimes the founders don't uh, have any experience building a sales team from scratch to a hundred people. And some of them don't even know how to talk to a salesperson. Like salespeople, a good salesperson in Europe is a shark. And if he senses weakness from the CEO, who's a technical founder, he's like, you don't even understand what a bonus is or how to talk to me. It's like, we kind of have a boot camp for that with like a lot of expertise. And I think that one is like, some of them really benefit. Some of them, you know, are like, yeah, I've built a sales organization and I know it all. I'll, I'll um, give you an example. And I, I, the company will remain nameless. I won't even say if it's a pro founders portfolio company or another company we interacted with, but the, the story okay. is um, the company had a fantastic product, very technical team that had built it. Uh, and it was pointed out to them that they needed to start creating a product to sell. So they went through the process uh, and, and created a very good product. But uh, VC goes in on Monday after a long conversation on Friday about you guys need to start selling, you need to sell. And the, uh, the book, um, sales for dummies was sitting on the CEO's desk and the CEO <laughs> said, I totally got it. Now. I really understand how, how this works. Um, uh, and the amazing thing was we thought, okay, this is going to be, uh, we thought, uh, it's gonna be an absolute mess. And, uh, it's fantastic because the CEO basically, uh, leveraged the network, called up everyone, uh, and got the first kind of hundred customers just through his own network. Uh, so it was impressive. So, uh, actually took on board some of the stuff from sales for dummies. Now that is not a scalable sales process, but we found it amazing that uh, they go out and, uh, and buy the book and start to learn from scratch. That's great. I mean, we've got a, we've got a mix of like these founders club guys that, you know, raised funding themselves or entrepreneurs, but some of them get acquired and then stay at VMware forever or stay at Cisco forever. Yep. And then some of them are just, they want to be an entrepreneur, but they make so much money on their options from staying at Google or something that those are often investors. And I like to sometimes get the founder in the home of the living room of the LP, which is a nice vibe. And the LP, he's kind of wants to be on the other side and be an entrepreneur, but he's smart to stay there and just be an LP. And so they yeah. get this vicarious excitement of touching the startup and saying, let me tell you how VMware went from nothing to this. You know, and, and I think that's, that's a nice thing. Also, I think, you know, if you're too, you know, you know, you, there's only so much ground you, you and your partner can cover, you know? So there's a scaling issue of uh, they meet and that meeting happened and you only heard about it later as the GP, um, you know, in that. So I want to talk about cash on cash versus IRR. You've been in the game long enough to see, you know, you can invest at time zero, exit yeah. one month later and the IRR is through the roof or you can be Pitch Johnson. He's still an Amgen 40 years later you know, with his own money. So he's like, the what's the IRR on his investment? But he owns a sizable percentage of a $150 yep. billion dollar company. And, you know, cash on cash is insane. So what's what's your perception of cash on cash? You know, so did you make a 5X or a 50X, 54X compared to IRR? And what do you think yep. your LPs care about? Yeah, so it's, it's, it is interesting because uh, you, know, you get asked every time you go speak to LPs, or especially institutional LPs, right, about what is your target IRR, what is your target uh, multiple on capital. Um, and, and you're right, if you invest one euro, uh, one dollar today and got back uh, one, one dollar ten tomorrow, the IRR is absolutely fantastic. The cash on cash return is less meaningful. And so we, um, we try to be pragmatic about it and it's changed over time. So in the early investment vehicles, um, it was 100% entrepreneurs that, that gave us money. Uh, and, and now it's more institutional capital, family offices, et cetera. It's hard, it's hard to go, get to 85 million with you know, just yes, my we, friends. Right? Exactly. <laughs> uh, unless you have really great friends. Uh, it's, it's Not so much. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, you know, we, weirdly, the, uh, the founders, uh, I found, were much more um, DPI, cash on cash focused, than institutional investors. Absolutely. Uh, they really were. They were like, "Oh, great! So uh, cool. Well, well, let, you know, can we sell some secondary? Can we take a five x off the table on this deal? Um, how much of the fund have we got H back?" Have you been doing secondaries? Uh, we have occasionally done. I think in a couple instances we did secondaries. Right. Um, and and uh, we, in one time with with Unity, we we severely regret it because it's up kind of four or five x. Can I just say for our listeners, when we say a secondary, this means Sean, pro founder, invests in a company. They're on the cap table. They own equity in the company. 
now they raise money from Andrews and Horowitz or some mega fund trying to get rid of their multi-billion dollar fund that they manage. And the valuation is so high, you're like, hey, you know, this is valued at over a billion dollars. We invested at a pre-money of 10 um, to just wait for the, yeah. for the definitive liquidity event of an IPO or a trade sale. Maybe we should sell 20% of our position, return a third of the fund, even going into the next fundraise that makes people happy that they got cash, not just a very exciting, optimistic call from Mr. Optimist. Yeah, no, it, that that that's exactly what it is, right? It's it's a way. It's also a way to to um to hedge your bets a little bit as a, from a fund perspective because it's great uh, if the companies continue to go up in value, but they don't always, and sometimes they go the wrong way, and uh, you have to think through the implications from a fund construction perspective, from a return profile, um, and uh, it, and sometimes it gets very very tempting. So we've done it a few times. We've regretted it sometimes. We've been thrilled at other times, um, even if the company's gone up in value because we said you know it's the right thing for our investors at that time to, to return cash back. And so, um, but, it, but it's it funny how, as we move to institutional LP base, they're much more focused on um, future on down the road, multiples of capital, keep going, keep going, ride your winners to the end. Where, whereas founders were way more focused on actually cash back, um, which I would have thought, hey, if you're a super successful founder, um, cool, let it ride. I let it, you know, I had everything in one company myself and I took it to the bitter end. But it is amazing how the mentality shifts once um, founders go from running their own business to actually investing money uh, yeah, and they become but, differently focused. But Sean, I mean, you know, Mar Marcus Frampton runs a $65 billion sovereign wealth fund for the state of Alaska. Um, for him, IRR is important. Cash on cash multiple is also important, but it's other people's money. If you are him as an individual and his twin daughters got into Stanford yep. and tuition is insane because they're given half the people free and not Marcus has to pay full ride. Yeah. That cash on cash is actually like all that matters. And IRR is like a notion. But time comes in too for the individual of a pension fund or an insurance company knows with certainty they got going to have inflows and outflows right. of cash. And if they see you as even young enough to do co-founders for another 25 years, they, that they can start to have a safe home. And they know literally 20 years from now, they have money coming in and out and right. they can be in a relatively illiquid asset class. What do you, what's your sense? And it's different for what stage you invest in and your portfolio construction of McClure to guys like us. But if, if a fund starts investing in year one, when do you expect to get some real DPI return distributions? Like what year, yeah. if someone's new to the asset class and they're investing in ProFounder 4, the new one, how many years before they get anything back and how many years before they should have gotten their base cost back? And then what do they expect? Yeah, no. So, and the answer is it's, um, it's, not, it's, not, it's not quite that simple, right? And, and I know... But the, the, re the reason why is that um, when someone commits, let's say it's a $100 million fund and someone says, I'd love to invest $10 million into this fund, they don't write the fund a check for $10 million on day one, right? That's not the way it works. Capital costs. We, exactly. We have the opportunity to draw down that money when we need it. And so what we tell them is we'll, we will do the initial investment over, let's say, four years. We'll, we'll put the money to work. But even that doesn't mean we draw $10 million in four years because we will draw down on a regular basis for Management fees, VCs got to get paid, pay for that Stanford education uh, <laughs> that you mentioned, uh, but also we'll draw down as and when we make initial investments. And so if you look at the cash profile of a fund, it's not 10 million out in day one. And then let's say in year four, you get back 20 million, right? A 2X fund. It's, uh, it's much smoother than that. And so what we've seen is that you'll draw down 10 to 15% of the fund a year. Um, maybe in the, in the early years, maybe a little bit more than that, 15, maybe 21 year or so. Um, but then you will have obviously have the reserves and the reserves, it's four year investment profile. Uh, a lot of the reserves will come in year five, six, seven, eight or so where you're actually putting the second, third, fourth round of investment to work. But at the time, you're actually then returning money from other businesses as well. And so I think in, in some of the early funds for us, like the mash, the, the, the key, the max outlay was only kind of 35, 40% of the commitment that you were ever out of pocket at any one time. And then a lot of years, we were sending back more money than we were drawing down as well. And so it's, it quite, it's actually really, smoother yeah. um, for, 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 for LPs to think about. And they know this, and that's why they can uh, invest in a lot of different funds. And they, they, they know the profile of what the cash flows look like. Um, but it's, it's, you know, it's, not, 
it it it, it um and it it, it depends um, I suppose. Okay, okay, it's it's a good answer. Yeah. It sounds awfully simple. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, 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 no. I understand yeah. capital calls and all yeah, that. Yeah, of course, of course. I can imagine someone listening to this for the first time. Um, so let's talk about Brexit with all the exciting. We're going to nuke every other country news from the White House. People don't talk about Brexit anymore. So what 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 is the real truth? I mean, I know like before Brexit became official, EIF made it official for us for VCs. They said yep. no more new capital commitments to, you know, UK domiciled funds. But then BBB came out with more money. British Business Bank came out with right. more money for VCs than all of the EIF or something. So maybe yep. talk about what Brexit means on that level, and what your feelings are and, and what it means yep. to. Companies, startups so moving to London. Yeah, startups, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I find the whole thing personally, and, I'm, uh, uh, um, and this is this personal view. Um, I, I find it just so sad um, what right. took place, right? I think I think the the broader kind of uh, the pan European ecosystem, the free movement of amazing talents and money across all of Europe, uh, helped really drive the growth that we've seen in the last twenty years of um, of Europe. Actually, the the economies in Europe and the startup ecosystem in Europe. And so I look at what took place with Brexit, and it's with a very heavy heart um, that that I see this happening. Now, the reality is, is it, it's happening. It's absolutely happening. The 31st of December is when the UK will formally have left, uh, or the continuing agreement, it left at the end of the 31st of January. The formal agreement that everything stays the way it was ends on the 31st of uh, December. Uh, so without a doubt, it's coming up in two and a half months, and there's a lot of work still to be done to actually get the ongoing relationship sorted out. Um, it's it's no different than any or, or most divorces. Most people can't consciously uncouple the way Chris Martin and um, Gwyneth Paltrow could. It's a little more difficult. There are fights and squabbles about who gets the dog and uh, the boat and the house and how often can we visit and, and all that sort of stuff. And it's no different here. Um, now, I worry that there's, there's a lot that's going to not be done. Uh, which will create a very tricky kind of situation in, in a few months. Um, but, uh, you know, from, so that, that's kind of where things stand. A lot still needs to be sorted out, right? Can a fintech company in London operate in um, in Germany after the 31st? We don't know yet. What, we so what's with the passporting of that? Like, uh, what's it's, with uh, the financial conversations, conduct authority? Conversations under, ongoing, conversations ongoing. What about, um, what about, what about your, your, your company in Krakow or Warsaw? If they... You know, I mean, it's it's a bit. London is a little bit like the look. look London is the most evolved ecosystem of the venture startup community across Europe. Absolutely. And you know, if you're in Alabama, you might get seed funding from the local government thing. And when you go to raise your next round, there's nowhere to go, and there's nowhere to buy. You know, buyers don't know about you. Funders are not. A, there's a funder at every stage in the valley, and I would say that's becoming more and more true in London than anywhere. But should so was it worth it for the uh, low-cost arbitrage labor opportunity from Poland and the high skills to come to London, where it's going to be more expensive, their burn rate will be higher, but they're networking with you and you're introducing them to others. Um, can they even yeah. do that now? Or do you celebrate this and say, hey, there is no expensive moving to London and we will love and support you across the border? Yeah, and the answer is uh, yeah, yes to both. Um, if uh, for certain companies, it absolutely makes sense to have an office um, in some of the uh, the kind of the deeper capital ecosystems, right? So I mean, London is is yeah, the richest capital ecosystem uh, in in Europe, without a doubt. Um, I think, but for a lot of companies nowadays, um, you know, VCs in Europe know they ha they have to travel. They have to go find the kind of hidden gem as well. And so we have no problem getting on planes and visiting businesses. It's not the whole Silicon Valley mentality. If I can't drive there in 90 minutes, uh, it's not. 30 me. minutes. 30 uh, minutes. 30 minutes. Just, okay. 30 minutes with traffic, you know, welcome to Los Angeles. So that's why it's 30 yeah. minutes. They're willing to drive yeah. 90 minutes, but, you know, 101 is a disaster. There we go. Yes. So in Europe, there's always been uh, kind of these hidden ch champions, hidden gems all over Europe that people have have traveled for. So I think that, that, that that's okay. And as long as the companies are well networked and are and are you know doing the right things and visiting and and so forth, it's it's not a problem. So for our company in in Warsaw, um, it's absolutely no problem. Uh, the fundraising side, it's 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 fine. Um, now, I mean, what happens post Brexit? Um, we have to see. I mean, can they ship the packages, uh, the boxes, the cardboard boxes to to London-based companies? We have to see. So much needs to be sorted out. Now, from a VC perspective, as far as what we do, not much is actually going to change. So we have been pan-European from the very beginning. We will continue to be able to write investment checks into companies in Sweden or Poland 
or Spain or the UK. So nothing will change. Yes, we do have the European Investment Fund and the, the clues in the title, the European Investment Fund. So they said, hey, if you're only investing in the UK, you're not for us. Um, but we uh, have from the very beginning committed to investing across all of Europe. So you know, everything feels good. On, so so, on so that you side. check the box, so you tick the boxes for the EIF right now. Uh, yeah, yeah, we, yeah, absolutely. And, and what about the BBB, the British Business Bank? Yeah, so British Business Bank has, because um, there are a lot of funds based here that had EIF money, European Investment Fund Capital, uh, that are focused on the UK. Uh, and they, uh, you know, that money won't be there at the next go around um, for them to, to, to raise from. And so the British Business Bank has made a commitment to uh, support the European, the UK venture capital ecosystem with, uh, with cash, right? Replacing the EIF as a base supporter for a lot of these funds. And so, um, we're, we're, you know, we'll have conversations. Uh, we're not fundraising right now. Um, we've got strong commitment from all the existing investors. So there's truly not that much um, available capacity. We're all going to raise a slightly bigger fund, so a little bit more. So, so clearly, we will we will speak to everyone that that has an interest in in the next Pro Founders Fund. Um, but uh, you know, it, it, many different people. And oh, that's cool. Uh, and yeah, these conversations, these topics can sometimes be a little frustrating. But uh, move on to something more fun. And I know we have to wrap this up too. Um, with with steady state of fund size, you know, I sometimes think of McDonald's billion served, and there's some funds in the Valley that are willing to lower quality of their work and lower quality and performance just to be bigger. And the management fee is enough. And and as long as people are still going into that as a safe home to put money that makes it 2X, whatever. Yeah. Um, whereas other ones are like Alan Patrickoff raising a $50 million fund after Apex. Like the guy could have raised yeah. anything he wanted. And he goes, he was like, Picasso, 50 million, that's the number. like. And that's a real venture. I, I cannot just force a winner by overfunding a negative unit economics company, right? To get it out on, on an exchange. What's your view of uh, the ideal size for pro founder even 10 years from now? Do you want to be 550 or do you like 100 or no, would you reverse? We, uh, we, we, we like small numbers, um, I suppose. Uh, that sounds that sounds weird. Um, but we like big exits, but small funds. <laughs> From Riley, uh, we know we we love investing at uh, the prove or disprove disprove or disprove phase of a company's life, right? So when they've done early product and market, they're just starting to scale the sales and marketing effort. They're just starting to scale the tech team and really getting a sense of whether what they've got can be something absolutely massive. And so we love to invest there, which means we're writing checks for one to two million dollars into businesses, and. Um, we don't think you can scale a fund that invests that size checks. Um, naturally, right. if you want to do five to seven investments a year um, and you want to write that size checks and with follow on capital, it, you put the math together and it basically says you're raising 75 to $100 million funds. Um, and so that's where we like, like to invest. That's where we'll continue to be. Um, you know, uh, we're not going to starve off the management fee at any rate. Uh, and, and the funds have done relatively well. So we're okay from that perspective. But um, that's, that, that is honestly where our heart is. And so, yes, sometimes I'm very jealous of these $500 million funds and they're absolutely fantastic offices uh, and, and so forth, but um, it's, it's not what I want to do. Um, so yeah. I, like, I like investing where, where we do. So I don't think we will dramatically change um, what we're doing uh, at all. Um, if anything, you know, we will expand the, the geographic breadth of the team. We might add people in other geographies as well, especially in a COVID-19 world where it's yeah. difficult to travel. We know we can do this job virtually now, or sorry, on, on, on Zoom. And so we feel more confident adding people in local territories. Um, in the future, might we raise a Pro Founders Nordics fund? Might we raise a Pro Founders um, Iberia fund? Perhaps. Um, we've had some conversations around it, but you know, for the next go around, we'll keep doing what we're doing, expand the team, add some more ge local geographic presence, um, and then see where we are a few years after that. Well, if you don't know them, I can introduce you to the AP, the AP6, AP3, all those pension funds in Gothenburg. I've been there and know oh, them. Oh, great. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I love the Nordics. I've actually been to Sweden over 100 times as trivia, like literally over 100 times. Like, if you want to find a good bar, I can't help you here in the Valley. But it's, I, so you know what's amazing? I've I've only been to Sweden uh, three times, and I've lived oh, here for man. fifteen years. So I, but I've been to Helsinki, you know, almost that many times. So uh, really, I've been to Helsinki twelve times. 
okay. I feel very at home in Stockholm. Like I really, I could tell you exactly where to go at what hour, like uh, which amazing. restaurant, okay. and coffee shop to this, to that. But um, hey, I don't know if you can see it in the background, but can you see that London? Thames, I see the Thames River flowing there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I'm closing with you here today. I used to live on Pembroke Square in Notting Hill. And I think I would see you zooming around in your bicycle. I think it was always like on, on uh, I was walking up to the gate and on, on Ossington Street, I think. And I was like, I'll bet you he lives on Ossington Street. I never asked you. Do, where did you live around there? And, and, and uh, do, what's your patch now? Just uh, just around the corner. So I lived on Pembridge Square. So just oh, around the corner, if you know it. Um, so I was over there. Um, and uh, it was great. But now, unfortunately, I hate to break it to you. Uh, when the kids got a little bit older, um, we moved further afield. So my kids, uh, so four years ago, we moved out to West London Zone 3. You've probably never been out to Zone 3 on the tubes. But if you imagine very central London and where Heathrow Airport is, bang in the middle between those two. So kind of halfway out. Past Hammersmith? Just past Hammersmith, exactly. So just past Chiswick. There's an area called Ealing, and we live in Ealing. Um, Okay, Ealing, So we have it. We have, a, we have a house with a garden. I know these things are unheard of for very central London, but uh, we absolutely love it. And my gosh, what a saving grace during lockdown, at least for us. Oh, have, yeah. So is that uh, Ealing Broadway? Space. Ealing Broadway kind of area? Uh, they're, 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 it is incredibly well connected. There's a lot of tube stations around. We're just near the Ealing Common, which is a big, open, grassy space. Um, and we're a stone's throw, kind of 50 yards away from Ealing Common. And uh uh, it, it gives us a lot more space than we had in old Pembridge Square, which was absolutely lovely. I wouldn't trade it for anything in life, um, but uh, it's a different era now. Yeah, well, uh, we're exactly the same. My twins were born in Chelsea Westminster Hospital, but now I can see this Stanford satellite dish. It's all mountains and UMTV cribs. Look at my closet after London. You know, oh my God, I, 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 I'm still, uh, Andrew, I'm still insanely jealous because even though we have a, a house, it is still a London house, not a US house. So I go back, I'll, I'll, I'll close on the story. So when my son was three, we went back at Christmas. He hadn't been back in a year or so. We went back to my in-law's house in College Station, Texas, uh, where Texas A&M U- University is. And so we went back and he's kind of running around and, and he, oh, I, I hear him say, whoa, whoa. And he comes running back, he goes, Daddy, daddy, you won't believe it. This house is so big. This house is so big, the car has its own bedroom. So he basically stumbled into the garage, didn't know what a garage was. And in his mind, the car had its own bedroom was how big the house was. A Texas garage, uh, it has to have one double garage door and one single. You know, where else do you put all your kayaks and everything, right? It, uh, there is a boat at that house and it is a, it's actually only a, a double garage. But, you know, for him, it was uh, the car's bedroom because uh in his mind in london cars live on the street cars don't have their own bedrooms well i miss london a lot man so i hope to see you soon don't come here without telling me thank you so much and uh talk to you real soon excellent it's a pleasure to see you andrew okay thank you john bye great good to see you